Good evening, Southport. Good evening. Yes, this is Misconceptions. And I'm going to go through a few topics here which are the sort of things which are difficult to get your head around and prone to being confused, people having misconceptions. These are sometimes prompted by questions I've had at the ends of other talks that I've given. So what I'm going to be doing is dealing with four particular topics. I'm sure there are more than four misconceptions out there in astronomy, in astrophysics, and I've said uh, elsewhere as well, but you'll see why the elsewhere is coming in. I'm going to be talking about an expanding universe, which is difficult to get your head round because it doesn't obey the rules of common sense. I'll be talking a little bit about uh, black holes and dark matter. I'll be mentioning rocket science because, let's face it, rocket science can't be difficult. I mean, it's not rocket science after all. And I'll be dealing with some quantum mechanics, which is a tricky thing for anybody to get their head around because, again, it goes completely against the rules of common sense. So if nothing else, I'll probably convince you by the end of this talk that common sense is not a good guide to how things actually work. What I'm going to be doing, the reason I put this talk together, was the result of other talks. So I'm going to be, in a sense, borrowing slides from other talks that I've given and put them together in a particular way to illustrate particular ideas. So I'll be saying which particular talks I'm using, which particular ideas are coming through in each of these areas. But one thing to bear in mind is there is no problem at all with having a misconception or misunderstanding something or being confused. So if you've got questions at the end of this talk or even during this talk, don't be embarrassed to say, I don't understand that, because what I'm talking about are things that are difficult to understand, and therefore, by definition, a number of people will find it tricky. But what is really amazing, when we think about the world around us, and world here could mean universe, not just the planet Earth, is that, well, we're just a species of monkey who came out of the trees a few million years ago and started walking around on our hind legs. There is no particular reason why we should be able to understand how the universe is put together. And so that's the result of Einstein's quote here. The most incomprehensible thing about the universe is the fact that apparently we can comprehend it. There's no particular reason why we should be able to understand how the universe works. And after a few million years of evolution, we seem to have got a grasp on things. There's still confusion, there's still misconceptions, but on the whole, we've got a pretty good idea of how the universe works. The fact that that works at all is in itself pretty amazing. So let's get going on the first one. Let's think about an expanding universe. A question that keeps cropping up time and again is if the universe was born 13.8 billion years ago, which is our best estimate at the moment, where was that? Some amateurs say, can you tell me where in the sky I should be looking so I can see the remnants of the Big Bang? We know it happened, we know there was a Big Bang, so surely there's something that we can see if we look where that was. So this, this misconception that the universe came into being and somewhere out there X marks the spot and that's where it all began. The basic misconception is the fact that you tend to think of a particular place. Remember, that means a particular point in space. But as far as we know, the Big Bang was the origin of everything, the beginning of everything. So it wasn't a question of space existed, and at a particular point in space, that's where the Big Bang went off and started to fill the entire observable universe with galaxies. So we can't identify a particular point and say that's where it all began. The Big Bang happened everywhere and arguably is still happening. The universe is still expanding, therefore the Big Bang is still going on now. People often say, well, I hear that the James Webb is looking back in time. It's looking at very distant galaxies, and light spends a finite amount of time traveling across space. So in a sense, the James Webb Space Telescope, a bit like the Hubble, is a time machine. It's looking back in time. So can the James Webb Space Telescope look in look back in time all the way back to the Big Bang, another misconception. No, it can't. It can only go so far. Whenever you're collecting light from very distant objects, you can only go back so far. So yes, the James Webb Space Telescope is pushing those boundaries. If the universe is 13.8 billion years old, the James Webb has gone back 13, 13.1, 13.2, 13.3, 13.4 
billion years. We're getting closer and closer, but no, we'll never actually get to the point where the James Webb takes a picture of the Big Bang. That will never happen. The other interesting question that I've occasionally got is, well, if the James Webb Space Telescope is a time machine and can look back in time, does that mean if they pointed it at the Earth, they'd see dinosaurs? No, again, it doesn't work that way. It's only a time machine because it's looking at very distant objects, and light takes a finite length of time to arrive from those distant objects. But in terms of how far removed the universe is from our common sense, a particular lockdown challenge I decided to set myself. Back in 2020, we weren't allowed to go to the pub and socialize with people. And people said, stay away from other humans, stay at least two meters apart from other people. But Stephen Hawking said, remember to look up at the stars, not down at your feet. So instead of trying to work out whether you are two meters from a human, I wondered, what is the most distant thing I can actually photograph with my camera? Not with a telescope, not with a space telescope, not with a huge telescope, not with a small telescope. What's the most distant object I can catch with my camera? I happen to be a Nikon enthusiast, so I've got a Nikon camera and a telephoto lens. During the lockdown in 2020, in July, in the middle of summer, not a good time to do astronomy, but still, the middle of summer, I put my camera, I must remember lasers don't work too well on TVs, I put my camera on a little tracker. A tracker is just a motor in a box. That's all it is. It's a box that turns the camera at one revolution per day. So as the Earth turns one revolution a day, the camera is turned in the opposite direction, and so the camera stays relatively still compared to the stars. So the stars don't move as a long exposure is taken. So I took the longest exposure I could get away with in July of 2020. I took a two-hour exposure because I wanted to catch a very distant galaxy. This particular type of galaxy is called a quasar. We don't have to worry about why it's called that. It simply means a galaxy with a very bright nucleus. The center of this galaxy is bright enough to be seen at great distances. So the dot in the center of this image is a star. I used that to sort of point in the right direction. I figured where this quasar was by looking it up. Somebody had already documented the coordinates of this particular galaxy. So I looked up those coordinates, pointed the camera in the right direction, and hopefully the quasar is in the middle of that uh, box, that square there. So I took the image, blew it up, and right in the middle where I expect it to be, indicated by those red lines, is the quasar. So all of the light, essentially all of the light from this very distant galaxy has been focused into just about one pixel. I brightened it a bit on the left-hand side so you can see some neighboring pixels as well. But most of the light from this distant galaxy has gone into one pixel of the uh, 20 megapixel camera image. And what is really amazing about this is just how far away this quasar is. If you think about trying to measure distance, it's a real problem. And again, there's misconceptions about how we measure distance to galaxies. The bottom line is you can't. You cannot measure the distance to a galaxy. You cannot measure how long it's taken light to arrive. The best you can do is have a look at the light that's come from the galaxy and arrived at Earth, and that light has been stretched. Because the universe is expanding, the light gets stretched, and you can measure how much that light has been stretched. If you know what it was when it left the original galaxy, the, the stars in that particular galaxy, and you know what's going on with the light when it arrives on Earth, you effectively say, I look at the spectrum of light of that object, everything seems to be in the wrong place, this light must have been stretched by a certain amount that you can measure. We're not going to detail how you do that, but you can measure how much the light has been stretched. And you can use that to say, well, if I know how the universe is expanding and I know mu how much the light has been stretched because of that expansion, I can work out, I can calculate the distance to this galaxy. I can calculate how long the light has been traveling. So you can't actually measure it, but you can calculate it if we understand how the universe works. But it is tricky because the light is traveling through space at the same time that space is being stretched by the expansion of the universe. It's a really weird idea, so it's not surprising that people get the wrong end of the stick here. It's a bit like trying to swim through water, but the water is carrying you backwards. Or a, perhaps a better analogy is, imagine an ant walking along a rubber band, but then somebody is stretching the rubber band whilst the ant is walking. And then you ask, how far has the ant walked? Well, 
it depends how much you stretch the rubber band. And if the rubber band is stretching by different amounts, it's rather tricky to calculate how far the ant has walked. But it is possible to do these calculations. And you can convert between how much the light has been stretched and where that galaxy must have been. And for this particular galaxy that I photographed from my back garden, it turns out when you measure as a function of redshift, which is a measure of how much the light has stretched, if the light has stretched by an amount equal to its original wavelength, we call that a redshift of 1. If it ends up three times longer, we call that a redshift of 2, etc. And this is distance. You can see the distances are vast, thousands of millions of light years, as a function of how much the light has been stretched. This particular galaxy that I tried to image has got a redshift of 4. I didn't calculate that. I looked that up in a catalog. And so what we can do is then calculate how far away this object was. So I can calculate that the quasar, the light left this quasar a long, long time ago, and the quasar was about 5 billion light years away. Remember, Andromeda galaxy is only millions of light years away. This object is many billions of light years away. The quasar was about 5 billion light years away when the light was emitted, and the light has taken more than 12 billion years to reach us about 12 and a half billion years to reach us. Remember, the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. So the light has been traveling for most of the existence of the universe. About 90% of the age of the universe, this light has been on its way to us. And during that 12 and a half billion years, the universe has continued to expand. So that galaxy is now 25-ish billion light years away. And here's another misconception. When we deal with this particular example, I haven't chosen this one for any particular reason other than it's the one I photographed. In a time period of 12-ish billion years, how much has the distance to the galaxy increased? It started off at 5 billion light years, and then it ended up at 25 billion light years. How long did it take to change by 20 billion light years? It only took 12 billion years to do that. So if you calculate how much it's increased its distance from us as a function of distance over time, you find that this object is receding from us faster than the speed of light. Yep, I kid you not, it is receding from us faster than the speed of light. That does not disobey any rules. A common misconception is galaxies can't do that. Oh yes, they can, and they do. Most of the galaxies imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope are receding from us faster than the speed of light. This particular quasar, I calculated, I can't prove this, but I calculated that this particular quasar, when the light left, was receding from us at more than twice the speed of light. And it slowed down a little bit a few billion years later. And rather oddly, it now is accelerating away from us. This curve isn't simply dropping. The universe expansion isn't slowing down. It started to slow down, but now it appears to be accelerating again for reasons we don't really understand. So perhaps it's not surprising there were misconceptions there because we really don't understand all the details of what's going on. But we are fairly sure that this particular galaxy was receding from us at more than twice the speed of light when the light left. And even when the light arrived, it was still receding from us at a little less than twice the speed of light. And it is somewhat paradoxical and difficult to explain without an awful lot of hand-waving and a lot of writing down on pieces of paper how it is that light can reach us if the object is moving away at twice the speed of light and the light is coming towards us at the speed of light, the light is getting dragged backwards. So how can that light ever reach us? And that's not some, something I'm going to go into in detail in this talk. But it's a misconception that just because a galaxy is receding from us faster than the speed of light, that means the light will never reach us. Not true. The picture I just showed shows that it is possible to catch that light. So it is pretty amazing, and it's absolutely mind-boggling. And it's mainly mind-boggling because we are not used to thinking about distances that way. The distance from Liverpool to Southport is the same yesterday as it will be tomorrow. And in 10 years' time, the distance from Liverpool to Southport will be the same. We are used to the idea that the distance between two points doesn't change. And if we want to travel from A to B, we can say, well, it's that distance, so if we go at that speed, it will take us this long to get from A to B. The universe doesn't work that way because the universe is constantly changing. Distances are constantly changing. 
And so we end up with situations which do not agree with common sense only because common sense does not deal with situations where the distance between two cities continuously changes. So that's why there's a misconception, because common sense doesn't work when you're dealing with such amazing things as an expanding universe. The intention was to jump from one topic to another, but perhaps I ought to pause for 30 seconds before moving to the next mind-boggling concept, just to see if anybody wants to throw out a quick question. I'll take more Q&A at the end, but if there's a question here and now, yes? That's when the light, light, light years, that's when the light left. So does that mean that then at the sort of journey towards the start of the universe, the how much you see in the observable universe would have that been a lot greater since everything the, was closer together? The universe was smaller. The entire observable universe was smaller back in the old everything was closer together. If you wind the clock back far enough, everything that we currently see in the observable universe, which is something like 100 billion light years in diameter, everything used to be a lot closer together. If you wind the clock back far enough, everything in the observable universe used to be only a few centimeters apart. And that is an even more mind-boggling concept as to how you squeeze everything in the observable universe into something the size of a golf ball. Now, we can't prove that was the case, but all of the indications are that that's how it was. So we know these galaxies were much closer in the past so in this case, that galaxy was only 5 billion light years away, and it's been receding from us ever since, and it's now a considerably larger 25 billion light years away. Should we move on to the next weird concept? And we can always return to these things later if you so wish. It depends on how much alcohol you've consumed as to whether or not you're okay with that. <laughs> Second misconception, matter. Uh, people think black holes suck, and also people think that dark matter is dark. No, uh, wrong on both counts. Black holes are awkward because it's very difficult to visualize. In other words, how do you draw? How do you get an artist's impression of a black hole? Black holes are often represented as, well, it's like a funnel and everything goes down the funnel. It's like a bathtub. When you take the water out, when you take the plug out, the water goes down the plug hole of a bath, it swirls around and then it goes down. So this common view of a funnel is an interesting way of representing a black hole, but it's not correct because nothing ends up coming in and then going down. A black hole basically just pulls things in from various directions and then it disappears from view. This, if you like, is a way of thinking about black holes if we lived in a two-dimensional flat universe. If we lived on a piece of paper, then you can imagine a black hole as being something that distorts that piece of paper. But in three dimensions, we can't really draw it properly. And therefore, any artist's impression of a black hole is going to be some sort of, well, it's just that, an artist's impression. It's only an impression of what we think might be happening. It's not a true representation of what they look like. People have said this is an image of a black hole. Well, sort of, but not quite. This is taken by the Event Horizon Telescope a few years back. This is the accretion disk, the matter that's swirling around a black hole, waiting its turn to get sucked into the black hole. This is uh, the accretion disk around a supermassive black hole, an enormous black hole of mass, some six billion solar masses, in the galaxy M87. It's a large supermassive black hole, it's a large galaxy, and that's one of the reasons they try to image it. They also try to image the black hole in the center of our own galaxy, and they got a similar looking uh, result. It's a lot smaller, but it's a lot closer. So it ends up looking like a sort of similar size on the sky. Again, it's not the black hole itself. It's the very hot matter, because as matter gets pulled into the black hole, it all heats up like the water waiting its turn to go down the plug hole. All of this matter is rotating around the black hole. It's heating up, producing light and x-rays and radio waves and all sorts of electromagnetic waves. So strictly speaking, that in the middle is not the black hole. That's a sort of a shadow. It's a region where light cannot make it from the accretion disk to us because the gravity of the black hole distorts the space around it and makes it very difficult to, for light to reach us. So there's a sort of a donut effect where the middle is a shadow where we can't see what's going on. Somewhere in there, we think there will be a black hole, but we can't actually image it as such 
because the black hole doesn't emit any radiation directly. It only emits from a region around the black hole. So we can give an artist's impression and say, well, this is what we think happens in black holes uh, as we get, if a black hole exists on the left-hand side, an accretion disk might form lots of matter. It looks like the star on the left-hand side is getting shredded by the existence of this black hole, and all the matter is getting sucked off and goes into the black hole on the left-hand side. Because of artists' impressions like this, a common misconception is if you make a black hole, it will just eat everything up. Black holes are so ravenous, they will simply consume everything around them. Again, not true. If you think about the Earth going around the Sun, the Earth goes around the Sun in roughly a circle in about a year because it's being pulled towards the Sun by the Sun's gravity and with the speed at which the Earth is going, that means it orbits in one year. If you took the Sun and compressed it so that all the matter in the Sun was compressed into a small sphere only a few kilometers across, that would be dense enough to form a black hole. If you did that, you would not find that the Earth is suddenly pulled into the black hole. Just because you make a black hole doesn't mean the gravity suddenly goes up a thousandfold. No, that's not how they work. If you've got a certain mass at a certain distance, you'll get a certain gravitational pull. And if you're orbiting the Sun on our fair planet and you convert the Sun into a black hole by compressing all the matter, the Earth will continue to go round in a one-year orbit and it wouldn't know any different other than the fact everything would go dark after a little while because the light would not be coming from the surface of the sun. So gravity doesn't suddenly change just, be just because you decide to compress everything into a black hole. That is a common misconception. The things that affect gravity are mass and distance between any two objects. The density doesn't matter so much. But still, artists' impressions like this tend to give the impression, as soon as you've got a black hole, all bets are off, everything suddenly goes very violent and very chaotic. And the impression is, nothing is safe from a black hole. But no, not true. If that was true, then the supermassive black hole, the huge black hole of four million suns mass in the center of our Milky Way, would have eaten everything. But it hasn't eaten everything. It's sitting there quite happily. Other objects are just rotating around it. Black holes are not evil. They don't have intent. They are just mass at a given distance produces a given gravitational field. It might be that black holes make up what we call dark matter. But the reason we think dark matter exists is because when we effectively do an inventory of the universe and think about what matter is out there, how much of this matter do we understand and how much of this matter do we not know about, it turns out that the stuff we do know about is only about 16% of the total. That 16%, you might think, is, well, that must be all the stars in all the galaxies. Well, actually, stars only account for a small fraction of that. That 16% is mainly gas. So you tend to think of a galaxy as being a whole load of stars and maybe a little bit of gas and dust and other things. Common misconception. No, a galaxy is mainly gas, and there's a few stars in there as well. There might be half a trillion stars, yeah, quite a large number, but still in terms of mass, gas probably outweighs all of the stars in most galaxies that we can see. So why do we think that as well as all the stars and all of the gas in any given galaxy that we can account for is there, how do we think that 84% of the matter that exists is stuff that isn't accounted for by looking at stars and gas and dust, etc.? Again, the misconception is dark matter is dark because some idiot named it dark matter, okay? Dark matter is only called dark matter because it doesn't shine, it doesn't emit light. But something that's dark, for instance, a dark nebula like the horsehead here, is dark because it's absorbing light. There are bright stars and other gas behind it, and that's absorbing light, and that makes the dark nebula dark. But dark matter doesn't shine, it doesn't emit light, but neither does it absorb light either. In other words, normal light that we would see with our eyes or any of our instruments, ultraviolet, infrared, it doesn't matter what the wavelength is, any of that light would not know about dark matter. In other words, dark matter really should be called invisible matter because it's not dark because it's not shining, it's not dark because it doesn't emit light and it doesn't absorb light. So it wouldn't show up like the Horsehead Nebula does as a dark object against a bright background, 
No, dark matter is simply invisible. So if it's invisible, how do we know it's there? Well, we have to infer its existence from other things. For instance, we sort of know how stars behave in galaxies. They rotate around the center of the galaxy. And we can see how stars behave that are close to the center of the galaxy and how stars behave that are further from the center of the galaxy, a so-called rotation curve. How fast are these stars moving is a function of how far they are from the center of the galaxy. And if we sort of know how galaxies are put together, we should be able to predict what variation we're expecting to see, speed as a function of distance. But this isn't, on the left-hand side, what we observe. You would expect stars around the outer edge of a galaxy to move quite slowly, because they're a long way from the center of the galaxy. But that's not what we actually see. What we actually see is stars move quite fast in the middle of a galaxy, and they also move quite fast on the outer part of a galaxy. That doesn't seem to make any sense. So the only way of squaring the circle is to say, well, if what we actually see is what's on the right-hand side, the only way things can move that fast is if the mass of this particular system, this galaxy, is much more than we're taking into account by looking at all the stars and adding everything up. So simply by looking at how galaxies rotate, do outer stars move slowly or do the outer stars move quickly, we can infer the existence, or at least we can infer what the mass of the galaxy is. And we can do this for lots and lots and lots of galaxies that are out there. And for virtually every galaxy that we've looked at, the mass we get by working out how fast those stars are moving is much more than we can account for simply from looking at all the stars and figuring out this galaxy appears to have a mass of this much, this many kilograms, this many solar masses. So we infer that there's something out there which is significant in the sense that the amount of dark matter is not just a few percent on top of the amount of matter that we can see. It's a factor of two, a factor of three, a factor of four, five, six, seven times as much as the amount that we can actually account for. It's not necessarily the same in every galaxy that we've checked, but on average, it looks like there's five times as much dark matter out there as there is ordinary matter. Not only can we infer its existence from looking at how galaxies behave, there is other evidence that tell us dark matter is out there. We think that the universe, a long, long, long time ago, everything currently in the observable universe was only a few centimeters apart. So we can think of that as a cosmic golf ball, if you like. A golf ball, a few centimeters in size, with dimples. The dimples are an analog of, basically, there are small variations in temperature and pressure within this universe. It's not perfectly uniform. If the universe was perfectly uniform in its very young days, then the galaxies that we see around us would never have formed. So we think there must have been some small variations in density and temperature. And as gravity took hold, we can run simulations that basically say, let's take a, a large cube, not the entire universe, but a large chunk of it. Let's fill it with matter and dark matter. Let's put in a little bit of variation of density and temperature, and then we just let gravity grab hold of that and run the simulation for a few billion years and see what happens. We start with something that looks very uniform. If we let the simulation run, it indicates that the, dark, the dense bits get even denser, and the bright regions here are the most dense regions of the universe, and you can see things start clumping together. Matter is clumping together into galaxies and clusters of galaxies and superclusters of galaxies. And we end up with a universe which is not uniformly populated with galaxies. We find it's very bitty. It's a web-type structure, a filamentary structure. There are some voids where there seems to be some regions which have got hardly any galaxies in them. There are other regions which appear to have shed loads of galaxies in them. That's what the simulation says, and that is indeed what we find when we look out into the universe. We find that the, the galaxies are not uniformly distributed. They are clumped over here, gaps over here, more clumps over there. But the simulations only give us a realistic universe if we include dark matter in the simulation. If we assume the universe is just full of hydrogen and helium and not much else, then the simulation does not give us the universe in which we apparently are living. So 
the simulations need dark matter to work and the evidence from how things behave, stars around galaxies and how galaxies behave, that all indicates that dark matter is out there. So although we tend to think of everything in the universe being us and the planet Earth and the planets in the solar system and all the other stars in the Milky Way and all the other galaxies that we can see, what we can see is actually only 15% of all the matter that's out there. Most of the universe is dark. And that's slightly scary to realize we've missed so much. In all of history, we never even had a clue until relatively recently, in other words, the last few decades or so, we never had a clue that most of the universe was missing and was beyond our senses. So we are frantically looking for it. Physicists are trying to devise experiments to figure out what this dark matter is. It's, is it lots of black holes scattered throughout the universe? Or is it something else that's out there? The answer is, again, we don't know. That makes it even more mysterious that we haven't yet found the answer. That's the second topic. Any burning questions that can't wait until the end? The simple mechanics of the movement of the galaxies and everything else, is that applying to the, the dark matter as well within itself? You mean how the, uni uh, how the Milky Way is rotating? How it's behaving within itself. Yes. Yes. When we look at stars in the Milky Way or stars in any galaxy, we need dark matter because if we just assume the dark matter isn't there, we cannot get the mechanics to work. Stars are not moving at the right speeds if the only content of a galaxy is the stuff that we can see, the stars, the gas, the dust, etc. There must be something else which we're missing to account for the mechanics. We don't really know because we don't know what dark matter is. It is literally still a mystery. All we know is it is, it is apparently there. That is about the limit of our knowledge. There appears to be a lot of it, and it appears to be sort of everywhere, but we don't know what it is and why it's there, and we don't know how it behaves, other than it doesn't emit or absorb light. Does it exist in the, in the, in the same way within the galaxy as within intergalactic space? We don't know. We know that there must be a fair bit of it in the Milky Way, but we are not sure how it's distributed. We can make guesses. You know, people say, oh, it's probably a spherical halo. Well, it might be, might not. It might be like the Milky Way. It might be more of a plane. Whether or not it's uniformly distributed between us and Andromeda or between us and the Virgo cluster or whether it's clumped over there and not clumped over here, we don't know. Telescopes are doing surveys as we speak, trying to pin down dark matter, and especially the Vera Rubin Observatory with the Shimonyi Telescope coming online in a couple of years, one of its jobs is to try and map everything that's out there to try and figure out where is all the dark matter. That will do for the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Third misconception. How are we doing from time? Oh, about right. Yes, okay. Third misconception. Rocket science. I mean, it can't be difficult because it's rocket science, okay? So, I'm not talking about rocket technology. Uh, anybody can build a rocket, that's easy. Uh, building a rocket like that one is probably a bit more tricky. But basically, rocket science is how you get from A to B, how you get from one orbit to another, how you explore the planets by sending a spacecraft out into space. One of the biggest misconceptions about rocket science is if you ask somebody what's the purpose of a rocket, quite a few people will say, well, its purpose is to lift things into the air and get you above the atmosphere. Yes and no, because the primary function of a rocket is not to give you vertical speed. The primary function of a rocket is to give you horizontal speed, because you can't go into orbit unless you're going sideways. So yes, it's a good idea to get above the atmosphere, because going to orbit 100 meters above the Earth is not a good idea. You're going to hit buildings, you're going to hit mountains, and you're going to be traveling through the air, none of which is a good idea. So yes, it is a good idea to get into the rarefied atmosphere. Remember, the Hubble Space Telescope is not above the atmosphere. It's in the Earth's atmosphere. It's just relatively thin up there. But even Newton realized that if you want to go into orbit around an object like the Earth, he knew of no ways of doing it, but he suggested, why don't you put a cannon 
on top of a mountain, and then you fire the cannonball sideways, what matters is, if you want to go into orbit, it's the horizontal speed that matters. So yes, again, we're ignoring atmospheric drag and friction and all the other things that physicists tend to ignore because they're too awkward, but what matters is horizontal speed. If you get the horizontal speed right, you can go into orbit. And if you want to get from one object, like I want to go from Earth to Mars, for instance, what matters is the rocket you use, which gives you a change of velocity that gets you out of one orbit and into another orbit. And all of rocket science is really about playing around with orbits, which might be circular, they might be elliptical. Unfortunately, the maths can get a little bit messy, which is why most people say rocket science is really difficult. And that's why we ended up with the expression that if something looks relatively simple, we say, well, it's not rocket science, is it? Because we assume that rocket science is horrendously complicated. It's only complicated because of the maths, not because of the ideas behind what's actually going on. The idea, I reckon you can reduce to one relatively simple idea. Take a hypothetical situation of two planets going around the sun, one green, one red. The green planet is closer to the sun. It feels a stronger gravitational pull, so that planet goes faster. That's it. That's all you need to understand about rocket science. The red planet is further from the sun, so it feels a weaker gravitational pull, so it doesn't travel as fast. Let me just run that simulation once again. So bear in mind that the red planet has got farther to go, but it is moving more slowly. So there's a double whammy there. It's moving more slowly, and it's got a bigger racetrack to go around. So the year, the length of time it takes to go around the sun, is much longer for the red than it is for the green. But the essence of dealing with any orbit or changing from one orbit to another orbit is if you feel a strong gravitational pull, you have to move fast. If you feel a weak gravitational pull, you can get away with moving more slowly. And that is really all there is to know about orbital mechanics. Everything else is just mathematics, which unfortunately is horrendously complicated if you want to deal with it in any sort of detail. But when it comes to, for instance, knowing that uh, a, couple of, a few years back the James Webb Space Telescope was launched on Christmas Day 2021, and it was placed at a parking place in space. Unlike the Hubble Space Telescope, which is going around the Earth in an orbit, the James Webb Space Telescope was parked at a particular point in space called a Lagrange point. And there's a huge amount of misconception about what Lagrange points are, not helped by the fact that some descriptions are just wrong. If you look in various web pages and some YouTube channels, you find descriptions of Lagrange points which are not correct. And then you can understand why so many people have misconceptions when they try and read about these things and they find an explanation which is not the correct explanation. But if we understand that if you're closer to the sun, if you've got a stronger gravitational pull, you go faster, that's all you need to understand how the James Webb has ended up where it is. Let's assume that the green is us on planet Earth, and red, let's, let's not get confused with Mars, red is just an orbit of another object with a larger orbit than planet Earth. So Earth, of course, goes around the sun. Let's assume it's circular. Let's assume it goes around the sun in exactly one year. The red object is further from the sun. It feels a weaker gravitational pull, so it will take more than a year to go around the sun. So the Earth is going around in a year. The red object is spending more than a year, so they're going to get out of sync with each other. So the red object has got a period of more than one Earth year. But what if? This was very clever on the part of Lagrange and other mathematicians of centuries past. What if you arranged it so that the red object is close enough to the Earth so it gets pulled by the Sun and the Earth? In other words, it gets pulled, the yellow arrow represents the pull of the Sun and the green arrow represents the pull of the Earth. As far as the red object is concerned, it's getting pulled towards the Sun and pulled towards the Earth. It's feeling a stronger gravitational pull. If it's a stronger gravitational pull, what happens? It moves faster. Instead of taking more than a year to go around the sun, it's going to take a year to go around the sun. And so they go round in lockstep. Now they are always going round together. The red object is always on the other side of the Earth from the sun. 
And as far as the red object is concerned, the Earth and the Sun are always in the same direction. And so that gravitational pull of the Sun and the Earth are always pulling them in the same direction. Again, let's just run that again. So instead of the red object taking longer to go around the Sun, they both go around the Sun in a year. Which means, as seen from the Earth, the red object is not strictly stationary, but it appears to be keeping up with the Earth. As far as the Earth is concerned, that red place in space is somewhere you could park a spacecraft and it will sit there at a particular distance from the Earth and it will always maintain that position relative to the Earth and the Sun. And that's precisely what L2 is. I'm not going to talk about the other Lagrange points. L2 is just shorthand for the particular point that I've shown here outside the orbit of the Earth which is pulled towards the Earth and the Sun, and that extra gravity means that L2 takes a year to go around the Sun, just like the Earth does. These pictures are not to scale, no way. So the Earth to the Sun, the distance is one astronomical unit, as a matter of definition, and the distance from the Earth to L2 is about 1% of that, 0.01 astronomical units, about a million miles. So one way of thinking of it is that the L2 point, remember, is always on the midnight side of the Earth. The Earth is facing the Sun, so the noon side of the Earth is on the left in this particular cartoon. On the right-hand side is the midnight side of Earth. So L2 is always one million miles above midnight. It is sitting there at a fixed point in space, one million miles above the midnight point on the Earth. Now, as it happens, it's a little bit tricky to park J. WST exactly at L2, so they actually put it in a little orbit around L2, but that's just a sort of a, a minor uh, addition to the idea of what a Lagrange point is. It's a point where the combined pull of different objects, for instance the Earth and the Sun, means that the object stays put relative to uh, the system that you're interested in, in this case the system being Earth. Now, just to make it a little more complicated, but something I hope you'll remember, is we can work out whether or not we can park at a Lagrange point. There's not just L2, there's actually other red dots, but we're only going to think about the L2 point. This particular weird coloured donut here is a way of visualising, can we actually park at this point here, and what's going to happen if we park here? Think of it as a whole load of contours representing height above sea level or height above the ground. And we're thinking about whether a ball will want to roll downhill, in which case, which way will the ball want to roll if this is a donut representing height? It's actually a donut representing energy, but we're going to think of it as a donut representing height. If we look at what's going on around L2, so we've got Earth on the left and the L2 point on the right. Let's just blow it up. The contours, red means high, blue means low. So if we were to place a ball at the red dot, which way is downhill? We'd have to go towards the more blue parts, away from the red. Downhill isn't away from this point in all directions. Downhill is not towards this point in all directions. Depending on which direction we go, downhill is either away from L2 or towards L2. That's what makes L2 special. It is not a hilltop in the sense of an energy space, if you like. It's not somewhere where it'll instantly roll away from that point because it's sitting on the top of a hill. L2 is not a well. In other words, downhill doesn't continuously point to the bottom of the valley. L2 is different in different directions. It's what we call a saddle point. Mathematicians would represent it by something like that. If you move one way, you go up. If you go another way, you fall off the saddle, depending on which direction you go. If you learn nothing else from this evening, remember that James Webb Space Telescope is sitting close to L2, and L2 is a Pringle. Okay, that's <laughs> because uh, this is a genuine Pringle, not these look-alike Pringles that you sometimes get from other supermarkets. Genuine Pringles are saddles. They bend one way and then they bend the other way. And that's how the James Webb Space Telescope is parked at L2. The Earth will keep it in position if it drifts off one way, but if it drifts off the saddle, it's in danger of getting lost completely. So yes, it does have to do a little bit of station keeping. The, the idea of parking at L2 is that it needs to use very little fuel. Getting it there was a masterpiece of orbital mechanics. Yes, they had to do the maths very carefully. 
getting it to L2 means that Earth will effectively keep it in orbit, but it will ever so slowly drift towards Earth every few months, not continuously, but once every six months or so. So I'll just give it a little nudge to make sure it doesn't drift too far towards Earth. And then they'll let it go for a few more months and it will drift ever so slightly towards Earth and they'll give it another little nudge to try and keep it in exactly the right place. It needs very little fuel. Technically not zero fuel, but it needs very little fuel. So the fuel they've taken will be good enough to keep it operational, not just for five years, but hopefully 10 years. 15 years, 20 years, because so little fuel was needed because they got the original placement so accurate, they are only going to need tiny nudges from now on for the next decade or two, and hopefully it will stay operating and be nudged into position every few months for the next one or possibly two decades. That's the end of the third topic. Any questions on that? Yes, that, that's a that's a PowerPoint thing. Yeah, well, I, I'm just going to say I'm glad you sweat it out. I do things like that. And make some printing money. Yes, in this particular case, I wasn't trying for accuracy in the sense I wasn't trying to get the Earth period and the Mars period right. I just wanted something that was short and long. So I wasn't worried about getting particular timing. I just played around with the numbers until it looked about right. But as you say, you know, PowerPoint is fairly good for getting those sorts of animations sorted out. At a guess, I would say no. <laughs> Pringles were out long before the JWST, um, but they weren't out before Lagrange figured out the mechanics. Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe they got to Lagrange's original mathematics and used that to decide what shape Pringles were going to be. To explain, though, when you take Pringle out, you have to have another one because it's going to attract Pringles. Uh, you're in orbit around it, basically, and you, yeah, pe people don't wander away from a tube of Pringles, basically. Yeah. Impossible. yeah. I knew there was a Okay, so last mind-bending concept, which is the only one of these four which is not, strictly speaking, astronomical. So you could argue that if the universe started as something only that size and everything was really close together, then of course it was tiny. So what we're talking about in the fourth one is the world of the very, very small, not the world of the very, very large. We're talking about quantum mechanics. Quantum theory has been around for about 100 years or so. It was developed because certain things, certain experiments were done and observations were made that did not fit our classical ideas about a clockwork universe, regardless of whether we were talking about how things were behaving on a large scale or, in particular, how things were behaving on a very small scale. We were just starting to learn about the fact that everything is made of molecules and molecules are made of atoms and atoms appear to be made of other stuff. But trying to understand how that stuff is put together required new thinking, which is why for the last hundred years we've had to put Newton to one side when we're thinking about the world of the very, very small. So yes, we've got this picture in our heads. Misconception number one is atoms look like this. Um, yes, atoms are bodies which contain a nucleus and positively charged nucleus and around them are buzzing a whole load of negatively charged electrons. And so to visualize that, we have this sort of artist's impression. But a bit like what I was showing earlier about artist's impression of black holes, it might be useful to some extent, but that's not what an atom actually looks like. This is wrong for a number of different reasons, not least the size. The nucleus is absolutely tiny compared to the orbits of the electrons. And if we did it to scale, the nucleus would not actually be visible. It would be smaller than one pixel on this uh, TV monitor. But the other reason that this is not a good representation of what atoms actually are is because this gives the impression that all the electrons, however many there are, doesn't really matter how many, they all appear to be the same. They're doing exactly the same thing. They seem to be at slightly different jaunty angles, but they are all in similar sorts of orbits doing the same sort of thing. Whereas we know that electrons in atoms all behave differently. So perhaps a slightly better way of thinking about electrons in atoms is to put them in orbitals like this, 
which are similar to the orbits of planets around the Sun, but different for a number of different reasons. You can almost certainly see the first one, and that is there are more than one electron in each of these circles, each of these what appear to be orbits. The inner one, which might be Mercury, seems to have two. The next one appears to have eight, etc. We know that's not how planets behave when they go around the Sun, but there are reasons to think this is a slightly better model, simply because it at least takes account of the fact that all the electrons are in different places and they have different energies and that's important to try and work out how atoms actually behave. But one thing that's wrong about that top picture is that an atom is quite definitely not two-dimensional. So at the very least we ought to say, well actually they're not going around in circles like planets around the sun or ellipses even. It's more like shells, and here the shells have been cut in half to remind you that they would be a complete three-dimensional set of Russian doll shells, but here they've been cut to remind you that they're all different sizes, and hence electrons that would be populating these shells would all have different energies. So at least we're getting a little bit closer to reality. But even that's not correct, because electrons are not planets going around the nucleus like uh, planets go around the sun. It was realized a hundred or so years ago that the best we can do in describing atoms is to talk about what's likely to happen. We can talk about this electron being likely to be found in this particular location or to have this much energy. We can work out the probability of something happening. We can work out the probability of if we make a measurement of this, what are we likely to find? And we can do the calculation and calculate some numbers. But what we cannot do is to say this electron is quite definitely here and that nucleus is quite definitely there and the distance between them is exactly this many nanometers or this many picometers. We can only talk about probability and it's not unusual to find representations of that to make it look like the electron is a sort of a cloud. In other words, if we were to say let's work out where the electron is and put a little x and then a little while later, let's work out where the electron is and put another X. If we put a few million X's down, where do we find that electron spends most of its time? We cannot be definitive, but they tend to form these sort of clouds of, in this particular atom, the electron is most likely to be found over here or over there. So we get these so-called probability clouds. And that's one way of representing the way we calculate what's happening to atoms. And it's one way of visualizing it. But when it comes to describing atoms, we have a problem. Not least because, how am I trying to communicate to you? Well, I'm using words. I'm also using a few pictures, but I'm using words. And we might talk about electrons as particles, or we might talk about waves, and we might talk about light as a wave, or maybe we talk about light as a particle. And we might be talking about orbits, not strictly the right word, but we sort of understand what we mean. And we might talk about electron spin, but that doesn't mean the same thing as when we talk about the Earth spinning. We know what we mean by the Earth spinning. We know it takes one day to turn on its axis. But with electrons, no. The electrons have no real size, so we can't actually talk about them rotating as such. And yet we still talk about spin and orbit when we're talking about the properties of atoms. But those words carry a certain baggage, a certain connotation, but they don't necessarily mean the same thing as they would in everyday conversation. So when we talk to students about, let's look at the orbital properties of this particular electron or the spin properties of this particular electron, we have to remind the students that doesn't mean the same as orbit and spin that you would know if you were, for instance, interested in astronomy and orbits of planets and the spin of planets. So words come with baggage, because if you want to use the English language, and if you don't want to reinvent every word, if you don't want to say, instead of the electron has a particular spin and orbital angular momentum, if you would prefer to say, the slithy toads did gyre and gimbal in the wave, that carries exactly the same amount of information, providing you define what you mean by a slithe and a toes and a etc. You still have to define what you mean by these things, regardless of which words you're going to use. So words are not good. The English language is not good for describing what an atom actually is. The English language came into existence for describing day-to-day -day experiences, not an expanding universe or the structure of an atom. 
and we've just said that pictures, well, sometimes pictures help because they sort of give us an idea of what's going on. We know the top picture isn't right because electrons are not doing that. And we know the picture on the bottom right, well, that's a little more helpful, but that's not really what atoms actually look like. So pictures don't work either. So if we can't use words and we can't use pictures, there is actually only one way to describe reality on a scale of atoms and molecules and perhaps slightly larger objects as well. And the bottom line is you're not going to like it. The only real way of describing reality is to use maths. That is the only thing we found in the last hundred years that actually works. So we can write down, excuse me, we can write down the maths of how to calculate what an electron is doing, what an atom is doing, why these two atoms make this molecule, how this molecule behaves, etc. We can write down the maths, and in the process of explaining the maths, we need to use words, of course, to explain what we're doing, and ideally we use a few pictures as well, because sometimes pictures help. That's not necessarily the be-all and end-all, but the bottom line is we have, to, uh, we have to combine all three in some way and maths is the bottom line. Maths gives us the right answers, regardless of whether we can find the right words or not, regardless of whether we've got the right picture or not, maths gives us the right answers. Quantum mechanics has been around as a quantum theory for 100 years. We have not been able to break it. It has been tested over and over and over again. We can't find anything wrong with the theory, even though we find it difficult to find the words or find the pictures. And the maths, unfortunately, is horrible. Um, the maths even, even what you think is complicated maths isn't enough for quantum mechanics. Um, for a while, for quite a while, I taught um, year three, <coughs> year three quantum mechanics uh, in a physics degree. And that assumed that the students had done two previous years of quantum theory and mathematics support to make sure they could deal with it and you end up throwing things at them which mathematically make sense but trying to interpret yeah but what does that actually mean is rather tricky even if the maths works you tend to say to yourself yeah but that doesn't make any sense the maths tells me the answer is this but that doesn't seem to agree with common sense indeed for a lot of quantum theory a lot of quantum theory goes directly against common sense and has done for the best part of 100 years. And whenever you've had a direct clash of quantum mechanics and common sense, common sense is always wrong, or at least has been up till now. We've never found any situation where common sense has come out on top, and it's shown that quantum mechanics is actually wrong. So if quantum mechanics says, well, if you toss a coin, it can be heads and tails at the same time, and uh, if a cat is in a box and it's killed as a result of that coin toss, then the cat can be dead and alive at the same time. That makes no sense whatsoever. Common sense tells you, don't you mean the cat is alive or dead, but we don't know until we've made some measurement? No, that's not what quantum theory says. Quantum theory says, until you actually make a measurement, the cat is dead and alive at the same time. And again, these things just do not agree with the way we think the world works. But that's because our experience is based on the last few million years of coming down out of the tree and trying to make sense of the world around us. Our brains are not wired the right way to make sense of quantum theory. So it is no surprise at all that there are loads and loads and loads of misconceptions about what quantum theory actually tells us. Whenever things go against common sense, a lot of people will assume common sense must be right, because it's been right every time I've tested it up till now, but nope, not when it comes to quantum theory. The architects of quantum theory were Heisenberg and Schrodinger. And you can see here Heisenberg saying, we wish to talk about the structure of atoms, but we cannot talk about atoms in, already in ordinary language. It was realized even then that if you try and build a theory which explains how things behave on the small scale, you run into problems because the English language cannot cope with some of the concepts. Schrodinger said, atomic physics has shown that atoms have no meaning. That's a hell of a statement for any physicist to make. Atoms have no meaning, but can only be understood in experimental measurement. In other words, the theory tells you, if I want to know what is 
the energy of this electron in hydrogen, uh, which is out in space in this nebula, you can calculate it and you get an answer. You may not understand exactly why you get the right answer, but you get the right answer. So some people have said this is a philosophical problem as to why it works. Other people have said, shut up and calculate. It gives the right answers. Don't worry about why. If the theory works, use it. So it is a bit of a problem. Why does it work? Hmm, yeah. Knowing it works is completely different from explaining why it works. And Schrodinger's cat, where the cat might be dead and alive at the same time, that doesn't seem necessarily to worry the cat, but it worries lots of philosophers who try and work out what it actually all means. If you take the shut up and calculate route, then you can say quantum mechanics gives some very odd results. But one of the things it tells us is that you can build a microscope that is based on quantum mechanical theory. And this is the result of a microscope that's based on a quantum mechanical principle. It's a quantum mechanical principle called tunneling. I'm not going to go through the detail. But it results in a microscope which gives us very high magnification. The side of each of this square image is 850 picometers. So this image is less than one nanometer on each side. So we are looking at blobs, and we assume that, well, those blobs must be atoms, surely, because they're the right size for atoms, they're the right spacing of atoms. This particular sample is a sample of uh, carbon, if I remember rightly. And so we appear to be looking at individual carbon atoms. Or at least we can ask the question, if we were to make an image using this microscope, what would we expect to see? And the answer is we would expect to see blobs like that. So we interpret those blobs as those must be the atoms that are part of this quantum theory. But the common sense side of things saying, well, as far as Newton is concerned, this simply should not work. According to Newtonian classical physics, we should not be able to image atoms like this, regardless of how big the atoms are or how small the atoms are. Newtonian mechanics says that should be a blank image. And yet quantum mechanics definitely does allow us to build microscopes that see the world on this scale. And just as an indication of scale, you can see in the top right there, if that is uh, one nanometer on a side, then a grain of sand at the same scale would be about the size of the moon. That gives you an idea of the magnification that we're looking at with this particular microscope. Whenever I see one of these quantum microscopes showing me a few atoms, I always tend to think of William Blake, to see a world in a grain of sand, because indeed quantum theory does allow us to do that. So I've taken you through four rather mind-bendingly difficult concepts, all of which suffer from misconceptions. And I hope I've given you an indication of why. And I'm happy to take questions if you want any further elucidation. Thank you all very much. <laughs>